This is this is some of the staff at Standish that gave up their time to help the wounded soldiers. I wanted to find out more about the staff. staff Standish treated 2,292 soldiers and only two died. There were three quarters of a million soldiers that died in the First World War and 12 million were our British soldiers. <clears throat> While researching my article at the, at the, of the journal at Standish VAD Hospital, I read Winifred Bennett's diary on her time there. She mentioned a lot of names of the nurses and colleagues she worked with. I thought it would be interesting to find out where they lived and any interesting facts about them. I looked through the census, but that was not very helpful. Then I found a website of the British Red Cross and they had put on the site most of the workers of the VAD hospitals. Each name had a card and where they came from what they did, their age, if, and if they went to any other hospital and if they got paid. Sadly, there are a few names missing that I know worked there, but the details must have got lost. I looked at every person I could find that worked at Standish and put it on a spreadsheet. And here are some of the things I found. I found that the nurses were not all local as I first thought they would be. They came from all over Britain. Three nurses were from Ireland and one was from Jersey, is the furthest travelled I found. There were detachments for the local area, Painswick, Dursley, Wooden and Dredge, and each ward at Standish was named after one of the villages and the nurses and helpers came from there. Some of the pictures I'm using are from Nurse Slinger from Painswick. She would walk to Standish along the top and pick up the fellow nurses on the way. She took some lovely pictures of the everyday life there. Two ladies I discovered who worked there was Kathleen de Sauté and Hermione Blackwood. Kathleen was born in 1875 in Yorkshire and studied domestic science at Cardiff. She gained a nursing qualifications in 1905 at Guy's Hospital, London. She lectured on nursing and hygiene at Trigga House, Cardiff. She went to Standish for a year and her wages were £100 for that year. Today, around 11600 She moved from Standish to La Pang on the border of Belgium and France as the hospitals there were very short-staffed. Her lifelong friend, and companion after the war was Lady Hermione Blackwood, worked as a sister on the wards, but there was no mention of her wages. She was the daughter of the Earl of Dufferin, County Down, and Vice Count Cladboyd of Cladboyd, County Down, in Ireland, where she was born. Her father was also the Governor of Canada and the Viceroy of India. However, she always treated all the staff as humans and was always kind and never stuck up. Hermione learned to drive ambulances and went to nurse on the front line in France in 1916, where Kathleen was also nursing during the war. Kathleen organised the Red Cross units around France and after the war set up an English-style district nurse programme <clears throat> in Green. After the war, Hermione and Kathleen adopted two children in France, Victor and Yet. They made their home in Hampstead and were air raid wardens in World War II. This is what the French would sleep um, in France slept in, but that's in Standish, the picture. Um, um, the spreadsheet shows that the hospital was very well organised. It had a laundry room and a kitchen where the food was supplied by locally or grown in the ground. The cook's wages were £25 a year. There were cleaners and nursing volunteers who worked on a rotor. Their jobs were to look after the hospital as well as nursing. The runners kept the fires going all day and the boilers stoked for the hot water. Five large kettles were put on in the morning for the cups of tea and all the washing up had to be done and the breakfast laid out in the morning the night before. And some of the soldiers helping with cutting up the potatoes. <clears throat> There were operating theatres with skilled surgeons and doctors who came round every morning and night 
medical officers got 12 shillings a day. Ida Matson was a teacher in massage and a masseur and her wages were £60 a year. There were three others who did the same sort of job and they earned 25 shillings a week. I was surprised that they had masseurs at that time, very forward thinking that this would help them get better quicker. Margaret Hyatt from Painswick worked there as a nurse and then she went to Ser in Serbia. There's some pictures there of inside the hospital. There was also a special flu nurse there and an x-ray department. This is Mary King, my relation. She started the AT hospital and at age 60, when she was appointed as commandant, her role was to oversee the management of the hospital. She worked there from 1914 to the end of the war in 1919. She was awarded an OPE for her services. She lived in the butler's room and taught the VAD nurses her skills, and she was loved by them all, or as she was always kind to everyone. I am proud of her, and she gave up so much for the war effort. She even let out Newark Park out for the soldiers when it got too busy there, and she died in 1923. I was surprised there was another one of my relations there as working as a nurse, Annie Lydon, formerly Miss Cartwright, had her wages raised from £20 to £27. Mary King would have been her aunt. There was a maid, Elizabeth Cole, was from Stonehouse and she worked there as a nurse in the war and then afterwards stayed with Mary King after the war at Newark. When it was Christmas, the nurses made sure the soldiers all got presents and decorated the wards and brought special treats from home. As you can see, the nurses did have some fun in the snow when it sledged in and that they really enjoyed themselves as well as having to work hard. There's an interesting story of a soldier that kept came, coming back to Standish drunk. This could have ended up with him having to go back to Buford Hospital and lose his good behaviour medal. They found out that Miss Julia Adams was illegally selling him beer at the Tunnel Cottage, Upper High Street, by the railway bridge. She was taken to court and fined. It was in the paper. Mary King had to give evidence, and as it was her first offence, she was fined £5. Today, around £500, which was a lot of money then. It was thought people would think twice before doing the same thing. But if it had been her husband, William, he'd already been caught doing the same thing and it would have been much more. There are a few names you may recognise because a lot of well-to-do families wanted to help with the war effort. They did not want to work in the factories, so they went to help with nursing the, the wounded soldiers. There's just some more pictures from Winifred from Mrs Slinger's photo she took. This is Miss Fillimore. She, um, the Fillimore sisters who lived at the coach house in Berryfields in Bristol Road. Ethel Fillimore was 46 when she went to Standish. She was quartermaster in charge of running the food stores and equipment. After war, Miss Fillimore became a justice of the peace at Whitminster Magistrate Court and got an MBE in 1919 for her contributions to the local community. When she was at Standish, she was very strict and the nurses said she had eyes everywhere. One day, Winifred dropped some plates on the floor. As her knee gave out, Philemon said, I hope you have not broken any plates. No, she replied, just my knee. She seemed happy and walked off. Margaret was 44 and did nursing housework, laundry and storeroom and Fanny Fillimore was doing general duties. Now Vicky is going to give a talk about the two other women of Stone House, Winifred Bennett and Dorothy Farham. Oh thank you Shirley, that was that was brilliant, really told us all about your research. Again we've got another an article in our journal in which Shirley gives more details about that. Right, so um, I was interested in these two women, partly because I've done some research. We all seem to be doing research into influential men. So Winifred Bennett is the youngest daughter of James Charles Clegg Kimmins. No, sorry, James Kimmins is very confusing, isn't it? Portland with the two James Kimmins's. And Dorothy Farron is the daughter of Edward Jenner Davis, who I've done quite a lot of work on. 
So I thought it would be more interesting to try and find out something about the women from those families. And then we discovered that they were both volunteers at the Standish Hospital. Um, Shirley found out that when she was doing research. So I chose those to do. And they've got quite a lot in common. They were both from fairly well-off backgrounds with these entrepreneur fathers who made their money from the local mills. And quite sadly, by 1915, they were both widows. Um, they, they got married, um, both got married in 1909 and both their husbands died in 1912. So they were not married for very long when they were turned into widows. So they had a bit in common. I'm going to start with Winifred Bennett. I'm sorry, I haven't got many pictures. It's very difficult. We haven't actually got a picture that we can definitely identify as Winifred Bennett or Winifred Kimmins. If, if anybody out there got some pictures of the Kimmins family, we'd love to have them. We've only found Emily, Alice Emily. So she was the youngest, as Pauline was saying. She, she was born in 1867. So her father was the one that fell in the canal when she was only four years old. And she attended her mother's schools and she trained herself as a teacher in 1892. Um, I guess she went after having done some of those exams that they were doing at the school. She, and then after she trained as a teacher, she went to the London Medical School in 1893. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find out what qualifications she got there, whether, whether she got any qualifications or, or how long she was there. Um, but she was certainly accepted into the London Medical School. So I guess she was perhaps trying to qualify as a doctor. Um, but she came back afterwards to be a teacher. So she didn't take up a career in that. And she also got a home nursing certificate in 1903. The, the reason I'm telling you that is because she actually had quite a background in nursing and medicine, which you would not guess <laughs> by the way she was treated as when she was a VAD. In April 1908, she married George Bennett. She was, she was reasonably old when she married, I think um, 40 something, which is relatively old. And she moved to Leonard Stanley. But unfortunately, George Bennett died, again, making her a widow. And she went back then to Ryford Hall to carry on as teaching. But in March 1915, she volunteered to become a VAD nurse at Standish. And the reason we know a lot about it and, and much of Shirley's research it is based on a diary which was called The Lighter Side of Hospital Life, which is by oh, somebody called Atkinson, whose first name I can't remember. And the Atkinson um, lady worked at Standish Hospital and she gave a copy to Richard White, who gave it to us. Unfortunately, it's not the original, it, it's, it's one that's been typed up by someone, um, but it's, it's a super record of what it was actually like to work in the VAD hospital. She was there from March 1915 to February the 28th, 1919, so a long length of time. And at that time, she was a 48 year old educated woman from a well off family. She had medical and nursing experience. And yet we think this is Winifred scrubbing the floors. We don't know 100 percent that it's her, but this picture was in her diary. So this is either her or, or one of her friends that she worked with. And they were certainly expected to do as they were told. It didn't seem to matter who they were. The VADs were the lowest of the low. Um, she comes across as a really fun person. I mean, she, she, she'd obviously led quite a reasonable life as a teacher. She'd had the sad um, business of her husband dying quite young. But when you read the diary. She, she's very modest. She doesn't really mention the fact that she's quite educated. She, she doesn't um, promote herself. And she's also quite funny. Um, this is one of the examples that there were supposed to be ghosts up at Standish Hospital. And she sat under the tree. This also points out that she was quite intelligent, really. I'd often sat there before at midnight and seen nothing, but perhaps that was because it was summertime and the daylight saving bill was in force. So it was really only 11 o'clock by ghost time. 
I should think ghosts would be far too conservative to acknowledge the daylight saving bill, which I thought was quite amusing. But she seems to believe in the ghosts, but then she's also poking fun, saying it was 11 o'clock by ghost time. Shirley's already mentioned about the quartermaster and the plates being dropped. Um, I've, I had, didn't realise Shirley was mentioning it. But it's where she was carrying the plates down the road and she says, I hope you've not broken any of the plates. No, I've only broken my knees. And then she's, she's quite sort of um, brief at the end. She seemed much relieved, which I thought was quite funny. She was also well aware of the slightly different class system in the hospital, because when you read the diary, it comes across quite well that it didn't matter where they came from, if, if they were the Lord's daughter or if they were somebody's niece or they were well educated, they were still the lowest of the low because they were the VADs. It was the qualified nurses and the sisters, even if they didn't come from quite such a posh, well off background, they were the top class and the VADs had to say what, what they said. But I think Winifred saw herself as much more down to earth. She, by the way she talked, she obviously got on really well with the patient. She did all the jobs. And I think she felt that perhaps she was a bit more down to earth than some of the ones that had come from rather more posh families. And I wondered whether she might have been referring to Dorothy Farron. So if you look at the bottom one that I've put there, experiences as a scullery maid. Although it doesn't sound so, the scullery is quite a swagger department. People who own motors and horses and in pre-war days were keen on hunting seem to congregate in the scullery. They prefer it. They are human beings and not worms like they are when in the wards. Well, Dorothy Farron was someone who owned motors and horses and was keen on hunting. So she, I think, perhaps maybe was someone who congregated in the scullery. I'm going to talk about her in a minute. But um, night duty on floor one um, really sums up quite well the, the class system in the hospital. So I'll just read this out. Tuesday night, December the 14th, 1915, I started night nursing for a month. I was given entire charge of three wards on the ground floor, Barclay, Painswick and Dursley, and 27 patients. It's very difficult for a VAD nurse to get used to hospital etiquette, and I started my night career by a most grievous faux pas. The day sister was seated at the end of the big ward when I entered at nine o'clock to start my night work. I went up to her and put on my most amiable smile and said pleasantly, good evening, sister. She made no answer, but glared at me with such a terrific scowl. I then remembered it was a terrible breach of etiquette for a rank and file VAD nurse to speak to a fully qualified hospital sister without first being spoken to. It's almost unbelievable that she was in charge of three wards, but not allowed to speak to the qualified hospital sister. There's also a whole chapter on pinching, in other words, stealing. <laughs> All the cleaning requisites were regularly stolen. But Winifred, she, she really took this being VAD very seriously. She went into Stonehouse and she bought her own set of cleaning equipment, which she kept with her all the time. When it was my afternoon off, I went into the village, Stonehouse, and bought myself a private stock of working requisites, chamois leather, flannels, dusters, vim, monkey soap and brasso, which I took the precaution to take upstairs with me every night to my bedroom. The chamois leather, which was the envy of everyone, I kept under my pillow as an extra safeguard. You can't imagine having to keep your chamois leather under your pillow. A man on floor one slept every night with a broom in his bed because it was a particularly nice one and he was afraid of it getting pinched. He also kept it in his bed during the day when it was not in use. No one could possibly have guessed there was a broom there. He lent it to me one day when my own broom had disappeared and after I had sworn secrecy showed me the hiding place. So that, that was what they were working with. Um, but she was really generous and friendly too, because she bought a lot of things for the patients from her own money. And if you read a bit at the bottom, I received one morning a sudden telephone call to return at once to the hospital for day duty in the wards on floor 11. So off I toured, my basket being as usual, ready packed for my bicycle. 
I bought some packets of tea and sugar, a gross of matches and some cigarettes on the way up. This was before rations came in. Uh, she did a lot of giving out cigarettes, which they obviously weren't thinking about the health issues at those times. But she also bought all those things out of her own money. And she invited groups of patients to tea at Ryford Lodge. I'm not going to read the whole lot about that out. It's rather long, but we know they were living at Ryford Hall. She, she calls it Ryford Lodge, but it was the school. And she took patients to her own home and fed them eggs for breakfast. She gave them eggs and bacon. They had tea in the dining room and they most enjoyed meeting her pet parrot which is quite strange as she talks about the parrot as though it was a person I, I couldn't quite get this she says she's all the world to me her father is a farmer so I assume where the parrot had come from and the parrot um, could join in with the national anthem and they took the parrot down the garden and the dog and the cat so she was really friendly to the people that she was working with and she enjoyed it and I think it came across very well to the soldiers, which is why they all seem to love her. Uh, she doesn't mention her education anywhere, but there's a few hints. It's a very educated way of writing. And this is all about being a house probationer and scrubbing. And it's where they try to work out a way they could scrub without getting too wet. If you have a look right in the middle, it says, Euchid's Pons Asinorum was child's play compared with her proposition. I had to look up to see what it was. A mathematical term, which it says in Wikipedia, is also used metaphorically for a problem or challenge which will separate the sure of mind from the simple, the fleet thinker from the slow, the determined from the dahlia, to represent a test of ability on an understanding. And this whole piece here is about scrubbing floors. But she learned that if you put a lot of water on the floor, the nurses didn't really like it and said, oh, please don't scrub my floor anymore. So it is really rather a good tip putting a lot of water on a floor. So she, she's quite funny, really. And the bit I liked is she talks about writing a book, Scrubbing Without Tears for Elderly Beginners. She is 48. I should never take up scrubbing as a hobby makes one feel like a broken need, worn out cab horse. I think after the war is over, a lot of elderly VAD nurses will suffer from a new disease, which ought to be called scrubitis. And then it says, I think I must have rather a brainy, intelligent sort of expression. I think she did. Or perhaps I look as if I've been brought up to scrub rooms and clean grates. Anyway, she talks about after the war, perhaps writing a book called Scrubbing Without Tears for Elderly Beginners by one of them. But also it's quite interesting to know that she didn't know anything about cleaning grates, but she bought her own grate polish, her grate brushes, and she <laughs> tried to remember some tips that her housemaid, that's Winifred housemaid at home, about how to polish grates. So it's quite amazing that she's asking her own servant how to polish grates and then going into the hospital and doing it. And these are all the jobs that she had to do. In her diary, she describes all these jobs and doing all of them. Um, another thing that points out the class um, sister is it says house pros have a good time on the whole except scrubbing floors. I thought it was quite interesting where she says waiting at table at the officer's dinner is quite fascinating when you have conquered the desire to join in the conversation of those on whom you are waiting. Because of course she was used to talking with educated people, but uh, not when they were serving them. Uh, after the war, she, she went, it's quite a sad ending really to it because after the war she went back to Ryford Hall with her family and the school closed in 1927. She moved to Kimberley in Queen's Road um, which is just down from Shirley's house until um, at least 1929. I can't find exactly but unfortunately she died in a mental hospital in Wiltshire. I couldn't find any more about what she did. I found this information mainly from newspapers. Um, so it was quite sad to think that at the end of her life, she, she had obviously some sort of mental issue 
and that's where she died, aged 67. So that's Winifred. And then we've got Dorothy Farron, who was born on April the 26th, 1883. So she was 20 or 15 years younger than uh, Winifred. And she was the second child of Edward Jenner Davis and Helen Hayward. And she lived, although they were both fairly well off, you can tell that the Davises were slightly more society people. It is possible she attended the Miss Kimmins Ladies College. She might have done, it was going at that time. But she led more of a society life. There's lots of bits in the paper about them attending balls at Cheltenham and organising fundraising events for various causes. And this is a piece about her going in a, on a balloon ride at Fate. And it says, to Miss Jenna Davis, fear and nervousness are unknown words. Although, of course, naturally her confidence was enhanced by the presence of Mr. Holwell. But she writes a whole piece in the newspaper about this wonderful balloon ride. And I did find eventually a picture of her. And she does actually look, she was supposed to be a very beautiful bride. I think she may well have been. She married Edmund Darley Farron in September 1908 with a very posh wedding at St. Sire's Church. And if you look in the newspaper, there is a whole page listing all the presents. I wonder what happened to all those beautiful presents that they had. And he was from Cheltenham. They, they seem to go to Cheltenham quite a bit. He was assistant commissioner in the Indian Civil Service. And the couple lived at Haywood's End. That's Haywood's End House, which is um, opposite the entrance to Pearcroft Road. But unfortunately... Again, he died. He had ill health. It doesn't say what was the matter with him. He died. Oh, I. Sorry. They said they all seem to die yes, they did. They, they both died in 1912. That's right. It was quite a coincidence that they did. So she'd only been married four years again. Uh, there were no children. Neither of them had any children. Um, then, so she remained at Haywood's End with her mother, Elizabeth Davis. And she filled her time with fundraising committees, good causes. This is a picture of her sister, Kathleen Jenner Davis, who drove an ambulance in Serbia in the First World War. Um, Dorothy obviously chose not to go to Serbia and drive ambulances, but she was very keen on driving motor cars. Now, I'm not sure which one of these, unfortunately, this is Edward Jenner Davis, her father. Now, from the previous picture of the wedding, this one does look a little bit to me like Dorothy, and maybe that's her husband, I don't know. But you see, these are Jenna Davis's. Now, is that Kathleen? Unfortunately, we can't actually definitely identify them. It's a, it's a lovely picture, thanks to Howard Beard for that one. Um, then in 1915, she volunteered as a VAD, and she worked at Standish driving motors, so the people that, <laughs> that Winifred was pointing to. And she also worked in the laundry and that's the record there, what she did. She was obviously a pretty keen driver like, like Kathleen was to her sister, because I managed to find this in the paper in 1937 for failing to stop with her motor car at a halt sign at the juncture of Clarence Road and Evesham Road, Mrs. Dorothy Helen Farron of Hayward's End Stonehouse was fined 10 shillings. So she's a bit of a naughty driver as well. What she was very keen on was putting on plays. She, she did that before she was married for the fundraising and she did it at Standish Hospital. Um, acting was very popular at Standish. Mrs. Farron got up several plays, the best of which was Ici en par Francais. Mrs. Farron and several of the men acted in it several times. And this is a picture here now. Is that maybe Dorothy Farron? I don't know. It could have been in the middle. It looks about looks a bit like her. I think the others are the soldiers. I don't know that there's any other women in that picture. I think the ones that look like women are the soldiers being dressed up. But Dorothy had a more fulfilling life than Winifred did after the war because she was a pretty high profile fundraising and committee person. And in 1934, she was chairman of Stonehouse British Legion Women's Section. And in 1939, she was one of only two women on the Stonehouse Invasion Committee, the people who were organizing the ARP wardens and the fire watchers and the food. And if you look at the, the um, piece there, which is from the Stonehouse War Book, 
you can see she was the sector leader. She was still living at Hayward's End. And this is her sister, um, Cecile Hayward, and she's living at Pearcroft Cottage over the road. And, and notes their facilities were to provide a carpool. Um, I think Mrs. Farron was quite keen on, on using her car. Um, she was also the leader of the housewife scheme, organising the housewives to um, help out in various different ways. And in, the 19, in 1938, the WRVS, or the W Women's Voluntary Service was formed and Mrs. Farron was the centre organiser for Stonehouse, King Stanley and Leonard Stanley. And she was reported to have done an enormous amount of valuable work for the district. And her name's mentioned several times in the evacuee book. She was running the British Legion. She was finding clothes for children. Um, when these evacuees arrived with nothing, I think people who've read our journal will know Ernest Weaver, an evacuee still alive, living in Stonehouse down at Bridge End, arrived as an evacuee with no clothes at all, only the clothes they stood up in, literally, oh. they had nothing with them. And it was Mrs. Farron and the British Legion who found them clothes and places to go. Also, one of the things that she should be remembered for is for setting up the Dovro Hill Trust. In 1879, Martinus Hayward and his two daughters, Mary and Helen, Helen is Dorothy's mother, gave Dov Dovro Hill Wood to the Stroud Local Board of Health. In 1896, Stroud Council sold it to the Parish Council, who controlled it until 1968. But Mrs. Dorothy Helen Farron gave a thousand pounds to set up a charitable trust, and that's the Dovro Hill Trust that still administers the land and uses the income from the investments to maintain the woods. So she in herself actually has done a lot for, for Stonehouse apart from being a BAD nurse. And after her mother died in 1943, Dorothy moved from Hayward's End and her sister lived there with, with her nephew, Martin Peter Hayward. And Dorothy died in 1973, aged 90. Um, so these two have got quite a lot in common, but I think Winifred, in that diary, so confident and funny, she, she ended her life on her own, probably with mental health problems, whereas Dorothy seemed to be a much more steely character. She liked to be in charge of things and to organise things. And um, also, quite ironically, both their family homes, Ryford Hall and Hayward's End, ended up being sold to Wycliffe College and now part of Wycliffe. So that's the end of my... I'll stop the share. That's the end of my talk. I don't know whether anyone has any questions. That they